Heavenly Father, we thank you for your beautiful word. We thank you that we can learn from it. And we pray in these moments that we share that you'll speak to us in ways that we understand that your kingdom will come in this place just as it is in heaven. Amen. Walking the way of Jesus is our current sermon series. And today we are walking the way of forgiveness. Hopefully we're going to know by the end of this that we are all free to point others to freedom with Jesus. Now, some things in life are obvious, aren't they? That you can see them right in front of your eyes, and yet we don't acknowledge them. We just go about our lives ignoring the obvious thing. So this morning, I want us to do three things with us. I want to help us look at the reading. I want to look at an illustration that I think God has given me. And I want to look at the point of all of those things. Having said that, I then realised what the acronym for those three things were. What's the acronym for reading, illustration and point? RIP. I thought it wasn't the great start to a sermon by saying, good morning everyone, RIP. So we've changed it. Instead of that, we're going to revert back to the trusty three Ps, the passage, the picture and the point. So let's have a think about what Matthew is doing here. Matthew is the gospel writer and he wants to present to us that God has sent Jesus to be the Messiah. The group of people that he is writing to, the group of people that he is speaking to, they're waiting for the Messiah. Matthew is clear that Jesus is that person. The Messiah will pay the debt that God's people owe due to their sins. Matthew would have known all about debt, of course, because if we go with the flow, we'll realise that Matthew was probably the tax collector. He was probably that same disciple of Jesus, and he would have known and understand the Roman tax laws. But also, he would have known what it was like to walk away from his little tax booth and follow Jesus. He knew all about money. He knew all about making the big decisions himself. But Matthew also made himself vulnerable, both to Jewish attack, because he used to be a tax collector, and Roman attack, because he used to be a tax collector. So Matthew is writing in this position. In our passage today, Jesus has, um, sorry, just before our passage today, Jesus has predicted his death for a second time. He knows that his death is going to be the final payment for all the sins. We also have a couple of tax-based sort of encounters which happened before and the disciples doing their usual thing that blokes do, which is they're trying to work out who's the best, who's the greatest. And uh, Jesus says, actually, you need to be like a child and like a sheep. Both of which are probably mildly offensive at the time. Children and sheep were unimpressive and yet they relied on another. Children rely on their parents And in this case, we rely on God the Father. And sheep rely on their shepherd, just as we rely on Jesus, the once and for all shepherd. He's also just talked about what to do if you fall out in sin as a church or or a group, as it probably was then. So today, as we listen, we're, we're listening with the ears or the lens, if you like, of what does unforgiveness look like? What does forgiveness look like in this passage And today we need to remember that our debt is paid by Jesus so that we can be set free. And our job then is to point others to Jesus too. So let's jump into the scripture today which Derek read for us. It's on page 985 and it might even appear at the right time on the screen as well as we go verse by verse. I hope that by looking at each line of the Bible, you're able to be inspired to read it for yourself. But there's also no point in me just telling you my story and then you going away and forgetting it. You can take a Bible away with you and have a look again. Don't take these ones though. Ask, if you haven't got a Bible, ask me. Don't steal them. All right, otherwise you'll end up like me. Uh, so let's uh, go to page 985. I didn't steal a Bible, by the way. Anyway, <laughs> verse 21 Peter comes up to Jesus with a question. I love this. It makes me wonder, what has just happened? Who's upset him? Who's who's annoyed him within the group on this day that he's going to Jesus? How many times do I have to put up with this? How many times have we said that to our loved ones before as well? Who's upset him? You might ask the question, what's all these numbers about? When Matthew loves his numbers, if he's the tax collector, 
And seven would have been seen as the number of completion or perfection. But also, we get a theme here that discipleship is coming to Jesus and asking your questions and seeking his answer. Peter might not actually like the answer that Jesus goes on to give, but he knows where he should question. We should bring our questions to Jesus. So verse 22, we have some Bibles and translations say 77, others say 7 times 70, which is, I googled, 410. Um, But the idea is it's a massive number, okay? It's a massive number, and for us, we need to realise that this goes wrong. We all get things wrong on a regular basis each day. But also, hopefully, nobody's going to sin against you that many times in one day, perhaps. But for those who love a biblical crossover thread, have this one. Genesis 4, page 7 of your Bibles, verse 24. Cain is avenged seven times, but Lamech, Lamech, self-proclaiming, 77 times. Now, some have linked Jesus talking about Lamech, and who was a descendant of Cain, who kept sinning. He kept sinning, he kept doing horrendous things and boasting about how he was going to get away with it and how God was going to forgive him. He was defying God and saying that his sin was okay. He would have been known as this bloke that spiralled sin within the uh, people of God. And Jesus is saying you've got to forgive him. You've got to forgive the people who sin the most, who are the most arrogant, who are the most self-proclaiming. It's really hard to be a disciple if we've got to uh, forgive people like Lamech. Verse 23 then, the kingdom of heaven is like. Now for us who have hopefully read some of the gospel and probably for Peter, he must have been thinking, here comes an epic. Here comes another amazing story from Jesus Shouting to Matthew, Matthew, come and listen. This might be good for your paperwork. Come and write this one down. So Jesus tells the story. The king, the master, the servant. Be a great Netflix drama, this one. Lots of death and punishment and all sorts. The king is there to settle his accounts. With who? With all the servants. Everybody is going to get their debts settled. One of our people in the story is in verse 24. A man with probably about 20 years worth of debt or 10,000. Why these numbers? Well, again, a generation was seen as 20 years, so a generation's worth of debt. Or perhaps the 10,000, this ridiculously large number that they could have thought of at the time. Apparently, Googleplex is now the biggest number. We used to have Infinity, but apparently people say Googleplex now. So it'd be like saying, this bloke had the debt of Googleplex. And everyone would understand it, but for you and me, this guy had the debt of Infinity. So verse 25 says this, since he was not able to pay all that he had, he would be sold, and his family too. His wife would become a slave, as would his kids, because of the debt he had run up. Do you remember the people of God were in slavery before God brought them out of it? It's that idea that they could be in slavery because they are not right with the master, the debt that they had run up. So in verse 26, we see the first time a servant in this story begs on his knees, begs for patience, begs for mercy. He begs for time to pay it all back. The man, or the servant, he and his family are about to get sold because of his massive debt. But he's set free. The debt has been cancelled. The master lets him off. He's accepted by the master. And he accepts the request. He accepts to be set free too. He's let go free. And with that comes his family as well. So in verse 28, we have our servant now set free and his whole family are free because of the mercy of the master. The massive debt is cancelled. Then he goes out into the street. He finds someone who owes him money and he asks for it back. The man who had this astronomical Googleplex infinity Asks for a hundred back. A hundred silver coins. 
compared to 10,000 bags of gold. And he strangles the servant in order to get the money back. It's quite a physical, quite a graphic illustration. I don't know whether you've ever had somebody try and strangle you, but that is an aggressive thing to stop the breath within you. God breathes into creation. To strangle is to stop the breath. The man tries to choke him. There's a flashback moment here to the parable of the sower, where the Jesus says that the seed which falls in the thorns will get choked. The choke is the deceit of wealth, Jesus says in this parable. The wealth was choking the word of God. The wealth was choking this man. The man chased his wealth by choking another. Even though he's been set free at the word of his master, he forgets it. And he goes in and he chokes in the hope to get his wealth back. And don't forget our master, Jesus. He will go on to wear a crown of thorns. When he dies on the cross, the word of God, the wealth of the world, the word of God hanging on the cross, cancelling that debt once and for all. Okay, back to the passage though. Our free servant is strangling the one who owes him little. And in verse 29, the fellow servant does just as he has in verse 26. He begs, he asks for patience, he asks for a time to repay Maybe in the future we could settle this properly, just as the original servant had. The repetition there from Matthew is to emphasise the point. They're both acting in similar ways, but look how one acts to the other. Our original servant gets the second servant sent to prison for not paying. And he would stay there until he could pay the debt. Now how could he pay the debt from prison? This is a lose-lose situation. One day's wages... The little bag of silver in comparison to a man who has been released of a debt of 9,999 more. The other servants all get together in verse 31 and they're in uproar. Everyone has been set free. They go to their master and tell their master everything. The one who you set free, he's gone and strangled, choked, trapped another The master calls our original servant back and says, I've made you free and you've done this. You wicked servant, Matthew writes. After I cancelled all the debt because you begged me, you went and did this. You went and did this again. There's a repetition in the words again. In verse 33, the master questions the servant. Shouldn't you have had mercy too? Just as you begged for patience, just as you begged for time to repay, just as you begged to be free, and then you were set free, where is your mercy? Verse 34 says, now the master takes the free servant in his anger, we often use the word wrath, and he sends him to the jailer to be tortured until he pays back all that he owes, the 20 years or the 10,000 bags of gold. And then verse 35 leaves us with an unsatisfactory sort of ending, really. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister. Almost a little bit, does that answer your question, Peter? (laughs) You could imagine his gulp (laughs) and sort of slowly fade into the background as he wanders off from Jesus thinking about what Jesus has just said. The answer is yes. You need to forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive. And if you're not sure, forgive again. So as we approach this Easter season, as we look deeply into the text, and I hope that as you read the Passion narrative, the Easter story, from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday, just look at the way that money is exchanged. Look at the way that Jesus turns the table on the wealth of the day. Look at the way that Judas accepts money. Look at the way they gamble away at the foot of the cross. Look at who is set free and who paid it all. Look at who pays the price and look at who gains from it. Judas gets his 30 pieces of silver for 
betrayal of Jesus. Jesus dies for our sins and Judas in his terror, I guess, throws the money back. Yet he goes and kills himself because he realises what he's done. Jesus came to set people free, not to trap them. We can all be free because of Jesus. So that's the passage. And what can we take away from it, from God? Well, I hope that we're going to take away that we are free to point others to freedom with Jesus. That's what walking the way of Jesus is. That's what walking a path of forgiveness is. We are free by Jesus for free. Apart from when you give in the collection. But you don't have to give to follow Jesus. We are called to be free. But in our freedom, we're not there to then go and catch everyone else out. But to help them come to Jesus themselves. Sometimes we're trapped in our own sin. But often in the middle class, it's not that obvious. Today I decided I would pitch a language. The sin. We need to acknowledge that we all get things wrong. We all are trapped, aren't able to do things fully because of sin. And yet we need to go to Jesus who will set us free from that sin. Jesus on the cross is setting us free from that sin. So as I ran along the prom this week, mulling over this picture and this passage, sorry, I got this picture from God. And it was of the people in orange chained. And so I did the usual thing where I thought, I'll do that. (laughs) Some people just put a picture on the slide. That would have been easier now. But actually, I thought the picture language spoke to me. Some things are obvious, and yet we don't acknowledge them. I'm obviously wearing the prison outfit that's traditionally put with people who do life in American dramas. In handcuffs, which traditionally is this idea that we are trapped... And we need to be set free. So how does the prisoner get set free? Well, hopefully they serve their time and somebody releases them. Jenny, can you release me? Can you be my (laughs) saviour? Now, just say that for a second. I'm set free. But obviously I'm set free so that I can point people to Jesus. Not to chat Jenny in So in my picture, I was thinking, I'm suddenly set free. And if I trap Jenny, now Jenny is uncomfortable, she's not able to live life fully. So instead of me taking the sin that was mine and trapping somebody else in theirs, We all need to be released. We all need to be released by Jesus. And when we get to the point where we are set free, we need to leave the stuff that trapped us behind. We need to walk away from it. Not throw it onto other people, not run and catch other people out. But ask Jesus to forgive us and help us to forgive them. We are all in prison clothes every day when we wake up. We are full of stuff that we're going to get wrong. But actually Jesus wants to minister to us and work through us. So actually we're not prisoners every day. But we live a life of freedom because of Jesus. So you have a choice with your freedom. You can share your source of freedom, which is Jesus. Or if you really wanted to, you could go through the Bible and point to people that they're doing it wrong. But our freedom comes from Jesus. He cancels the debt and we can ask him for that. But also we can share love with others and help them to be set free by Jesus. So just as you think today, I want to challenge all of us to think, what do we need to be set free from? Maybe there's an area in which we need to ask for forgiveness from others. Or we need to forgive others ourselves. And how can we help bring this love that is so evident in the Bible. And freedom which is here for everyone. 
How can we help people to walk the way of Jesus, to know that they're forgiven? So there you go. You didn't rest in peace, but you did hear about the passage, a picture, and the point. This point is that we are all free to worship Jesus in fullness. Amen.